name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Peace be with you. And also with you. Brothers and sisters, welcome to this celebration. This is the day that God spoke and the world came into being. This is the day when Christ uh, victoriously rose again from death. This is the day we celebrate the gift of the Spirit who animates and sustains the life of the church and indeed the whole created order. This is the Lord's day. And so we fulfill our duty and our joy by worshiping our Lord on this day. And in doing so, we join with all Christians from the beginning, in every generation, and in our own time too. We look to the Lord to speak to us through his word and to feed us with the gift of himself in the Holy Sacrament. So as we rejoice, let us first of all, of course, call to mind our need of the mercy of God and ask for his forgiveness. Almighty God, have mercy on us. Forgive us our sins and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Amen.
Let us pray. Generous God, whose hand is open to fill all things living with plenteousness, make us ever thankful for your goodness and grant that we, remembering the account that we must one day give, may be faithful stewards of your bounty. We ask our prayer through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, ever one God, world without end. Amen. Amen. Now, brothers and sisters, let's listen as Happy reads to us from Paul's letter to the Philippians. A reading from Paul's letter to the Philippians. If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a phrases, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, this I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the Lord, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the richnesses from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his suffering by becoming like him in his death. If somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal but I pass on the make it my own, because Christ Jesus hath made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but he this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straying forward to what lies ahead. I press to towards the goal to prize of the heavenly call by God of Christ, Christ Jesus for the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
be with you. And And also also with you. A reading from the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, He will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the harvest time. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures, The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they realised that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds, because the crowds regarded him as a prophet. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Brothers and sisters, did you, did you notice in that list that Paul presents to the Philippians in that first reading, that list of things for which he had some pride in his former life, that he thought were gains but now sees as losses, that in the midst of those things, Hebrew, Pharisee, righteous by the law, he includes that he was a persecutor, his zeal for the persecution of the church. In this way, of course, he is aligned with those Pharisees to whom Jesus addresses his parables in this group of parables that really begin the process of loathing of Jesus and their their desire to destroy him, to have him arrested, but they can't at this time cajole a crowd, though they will learn how to turn a crowd for the sake of the persecution of Jesus himself. Paul, in that sense, is with those Pharisees, even if he wasn't present. Jesus points out to the Pharisees the inappropriateness of their assurance of their place in the kingdom. He exposes the thinness of their piety He exposes their temptation to put themselves as leaders in an unservant-like role, even to take the place of God as if to speak for him. And their lives are not fruitful. Paul comes to a realization of this 
and it's transforming. Now, I mentioned the persecution of the church because I want to point out to you um, Paul's repeated use of the same Greek word. You don't get it in the English translation. And for me, it's remarkable because it speaks of his former life and his new life, where all that matters to him is Christ Jesus. And it's the word that's translated in the early bit with persecute. But later on in the passage, towards the end, Paul uses the same word, basically the same word, that's translated in our text as press on. I press on, straining forward, straining forward. Press on towards the upward call. This is now Paul's urgency. It's a remarkable change of life from persecution to pressing on in the life forgetting what lies behind. The very things he mentions, perhaps he can't quite forget. Straining forward with, as so often Paul does, using imagery that will strike at the heart of the Roman Empire, the great athletes. Imagine the runner who's straining, straining and pressing themselves forward for the tape at the end of the race. This is what Paul is talking about, this zealous energy which was once for persecuting the church. This is now a single-minded pursuit for him. He says, this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, straining ahead, pressing on. The former zeal for persecution has been overwhelmed by mercy. The mercy he received and the mercy he continues to receive as he runs the race, striving by grace for perfection in Christ Jesus. I'm struck by that uh, forgetting what lies behind. And there is an appropriate forgetfulness in, in, in the spiritual life as we turn our eyes toward Jesus day by day. Some things that are not easy to forget. Our sins, even once they're confessed, sometimes linger on and hinder the race, the straining. Past hurts and bitter blows, real or supposed. Hopes and expectations unfulfilled. These things one must learn to put behind us as we strain forward, pressing on, not holding on to them, but holding on to the reliability of the Savior and the sufficiency of his saving work and putting our faith in him. Some of you will have been uh, listening to a sermon I preached a few, two weeks ago, perhaps, or three, on that remarkable uh, passage earlier in this epistle in the first chapter, to live Christ, to die gain. And I want to reflect just for a few minutes, not setting aside the parable of Jesus. There'll be, there'll be more of these parables to the Pharisees to get on with in the next weeks. Uh, but I'd like to just reflect a little on what Paul is saying in this part of his letter, just as passionately as he spoke two weeks ago to us. Of course, it's not just past sins we see that are the rubbish that has to be cast aside, though surely they do, but also past glories. The very life by which he pursued righteousness and sought to, if I can put it this way, gain merit before the Lord, his obedience to the law, his holding fast to the rituals, which indeed God had given, but could not be presumed upon. People I've been speaking to recently, and maybe even in preaching, know that I, I, I do a lot of reflecting about the difference between trusting and presumption. We trust God, but we must not presume upon God. As it seems, it seems, Paul may have done, and the Pharisees certainly. 
a new thing has dawned. The everlasting man, Jesus Christ, changes everything. All I want is to know Christ and have faith in him. Of course, Paul knew very little of Jesus when he first encounters the risen Lord on the Damascus Road. Uh, conversion is not so much experienced as head knowledge, but a striking of the heart, which requires pondering and searching. Paul learns as time goes by about the one he is putting his faith in. He goes away for three years. He, he listens surely to Ananias and the others, and he goes up to Jerusalem and sits at the feet of the first disciples, the first apostles, as he learns, and then he hands on the tradition that was handed on to him, little by little, and no doubt through his prayer and sharing the breaking of bread. He comes to know Christ in that beautiful intimacy that is surely the longing of Jesus for all of us. And so he can say, Christ Jesus is my Lord, not simply the Lord. And that, I think, is actually one of the conversion things. When a person doesn't just talk about Jesus Christ, the Lord, but my Lord, who is our Lord. It is that discovery, which was surely Paul's, that really gives us the strength and the joy to live the Christian life in the midst of the changes and chances, and indeed, as Paul says, amidst the sufferings. Of course, the losses that Paul has given up, the losses of past understandings of righteousness, added to those losses are the sufferings that are imposed upon him, which he accepts with a measure of extraordinary joy as part of God's purposes and as a way of uniting himself to Christ. He is stripped by others. He is flogged in the very Philippi, the Christians to which he is writing. In that city, he is flogged. His skin is ripped off his back. He loses his freedom in prison. He is tested. But for Paul, this almost becomes gain. And then he says, did you notice that lovely phrase, he wants to be found in him. I want to be found in Christ Jesus. I want to be found righteous, and my righteousness can only come through faith in the saving work of Christ. I cannot stand before the Father in my own right, Paul discovers, not in my obedience, but in his. For Paul, when he stands before the judgment seat of God, by, for which we all will and we, we all will, it is a righteousness that is provided by God himself who comes into our midst. He provides the means of righteousness rather than that terrible, well, the English were terrible at it, Pelagian heresy that I have to pull myself up by my own bootstraps no, no, no. Faith in the saving work of Christ, the all-sufficiency of Christ, the all-love of Christ. To be found in him. As I was reflecting on this, I was taken to that beautiful communion hymn that many of you know is a favorite of mine. And now, O oh Father, mindful of thy love. In that hymn, look, Father, look on his anointed face. And only look on us as found in him. Heavenly Father, do not look at me, but through your Son and through his wounds. Earlier in the letter, Paul will use the word found in another context when he says Christ Jesus um, was found in human form. That's in chapter 2. 
Look at Jesus and you'll see a man. He was in human form. Look at Paul and you'll find a man in Christ. You will find Christ shining through Paul. The glory of Christ on his face, which in 2 Corinthians he says is a possibility for all of us. The face of Christ, being found in Christ, Christ found in us. Paul wants to be fashioned in his likeness, in the likeness of Christ. And is content to stand before God, clinging only to Jesus. And he will be content to stand before his enemies with only Jesus. I want to know Christ, says Paul, and the power of his resurrection, power, dunamis, dynamite, the risen life. He has experienced the risen Lord. He wants to know the power of the victory of Christ over sin. The risen Lamb, a life in intimate union with him, which will be a foretaste of what is to come. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection, but also to share in his suffering, share, uh, it better translated, the fellowship of his suffering, becoming like him in his death. In some translations, reproducing the pattern of his death. What would it mean to reproduce the pattern of Christ's death? Of course, it is not that I could in any sense reproduce his, the saving work of Christ that is entirely his uniquely. But surely to live a life reproducing the pattern of Christ's death is to live a life of self-giving love. That sort of life. For that is what is happening in the death of Christ, an act of self-giving love. Paul pours his life out for Christ and for the sake of the church. And it costs him everything in the end. But then, uh, not only this, though the power of the resurrection now reproduce the pattern of his death, but that by all means possible, says verse 11, I may attain the resurrection of the dead. Actually, it literally in the Greek, attain resurrection from among the corpses. It's an extraordinary phrase. This more that is to come. Paul shares the risen life, we share the risen life, and yet there is the consummation of all things. When loose ends will be tied up, there'll be no more conflicts. Wanderings will disappear and we will be fully in the presence of the Lord, living our risen life completely. And Paul presses on. Why? He presses on to make this life his own because Christ has captured him. That's a good translation. Christ Jesus has captured me. And he strains ahead, pressing and pressing. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. That upward call, that heavenly call that will come. I like to think of that sometimes when I'm standing at the altar and uh, in those uh, versicles at the start of the great Eucharistic prayer, lift up your hearts. How high are we to lift our hearts, brothers and sisters? To heaven. For pray God, the heavenly call will come as it came for this beloved apostle through martyrdom, the heavenly call, the upward call, it's sometimes translated. This is our hope. 
This is our life. Brothers and sisters, I really encourage you to take Paul's letter to the Philippians to your hearts. And, and these verses, which are in your service paper or on the online or in your own Bible, of course, reflect on Paul's transformation, the things he now counts as rubbish, one who was a persecutor of the church of God, who now with the same zeal and energy presses on, straining like an athlete, grace at work, or as I like to say, grace and grit. That's the life of a disciple. That's a life worth living. That's truly a gain. Thanks be to God for his word. Brothers and sisters, what rich gifts we have in the creeds of our church. And I invite you now to join me and join, join Christians everywhere in proclaiming our faith. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sin. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And now, dear friends in Christ, let us pray for the church and for the world and thank God for his great love. Let us pray. Living God, we bless you for the community of faith, this great vineyard into which you have called us, and we pray for its spiritual welfare. For all stewards of the church, its bishops, priests, deacons, and lay leaders, we pray for integrity, for a depth of loyalty to you, Lord, and a, willing to, a willingness to make sacrifices small and great for the sake of our Saviour and his people. Mindful of the account each of us must one day give, we pray for self-insight for every Christian that you might shape us into a people who do not seek after the security of our own interests or positions of influence, but who look beyond ourselves to the service of your kingdom. We pray for vocations to baptism, to the contemplative life, and for the church's prophetic witness in the world. For your whole people, we pray for the grace of perseverance in the faith, that each might be granted courage and zeal to press on towards the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Loving Father, we pray for the world, for all countries overwhelmed by sickness, by isolation, or by hunger and poverty in these days. We pray for all civil authorities, elders and leaders of community, 
kindle and sustain their desire to exercise their influence responsibly with respect and compassion for their people. For all people, we pray for the gift of patience as we try to navigate these strange days. We pray for places in this world subject to civil unrest or conflict with neighboring nations, for the wisdom to recognize ourselves as one human family with a common origin in you, our reconciling God, and for humility to overcome the confused loyalties and pride that continues to divide our world. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we pray for our local communities, for every heart and home here in Brunswick. We bless you for the quiet resilience of this community and pray for encouragement for all responsible for caring for others in these days. For any in our midst who feel neglected, downtrodden, or even like the rubbish of this world, that they might discover a friend in Christ's bruised countenance. We pray for any who are vulnerable, struggling with pain, any who are overworked, any struggling with feelings of resentment or listlessness, listlessness under the present restrictions. For the community who rallies around Christ Church, we bless you. For every person, every voice, and every face who makes up our number, both new and old, we pray for the grace to notice the simple blessings you send our way each day, for a clarity of faith in our community's foundation. May that cornerstone whom the builders rejected remain ever at the centre of our shared life, even Jesus Christ our Lord. Lord, in your mercy. Loving Father, you have good, given us good reason to believe death is not the end of the story of our life. In the weighty hope of the resurrection, we dare to pray for those who have gone before us, for those who have died recently, in this past week, for any who have died unprepared due to illness, accident, or human violence, for any who have died while still struggling and stumbling through this life, and for all who have died in the peace of Christ. Among those whose year's mind occurs this week, we pray for James McKay, William Hunter, priest, William Robbins, George Armstrong, Philip Purcell, Alan Cudgley, Leslie Drew, Gabrielle Keysmith, Annie Everard, Richard Pisani, Frederick Hines, and for Samuel Harper, priest. Lord, in your mercy. Living Lord, we rejoice in our communion with the saints of every generation and every nation. We call upon their prayers, and especially upon the prayers of Mary, Mother of the Lord, as together we say, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Finally, Father, we pray for ourselves. You are the font of every blessing and of all righteousness. Help us to keep on in our discovery of the faith and the way of life that flows from the gospel. We pray for the presence of your Holy Spirit in our midst to guide us through these days, to draw us into a genuine harmony with one another, to make of us faithful tenants in this world and indeed faithful citizens of your heaven heavenly kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our Almighty God, you have promised to hear our prayers. Grant, Grant that what we ask in faith, faith we may by your grace receive, through, through Jesus Christ, Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. We are the body of Christ in the one spirit. We were all baptized into one body. Let us then pursue all that makes for peace and build up our common life. And the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right. It is our duty, our joy and our salvation that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ, your only Son, our Lord. For he is the true High Priest, who has freed us from our sins and made us a royal priesthood, to serve you, our God and Father. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and singing. Holy and gracious God, all creation rightly gives you praise. All life, all holiness comes from you through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, whom you sent to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. Hear us, merciful Lord, through Christ, accept our sacrifice of praise and by the power of your word and Holy Spirit, sanctify this bread and wine, that we who share in this holy sacrament may be partakers of Christ's body and blood. Who, when his hour had come, on the night before he went up to the cross, took bread and gave you thanks, he broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. And he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Let us proclaim the mystery of our faith. Therefore, in obedience to his command, we commemorate and celebrate his saving passion and death, his mighty resurrection and ascension to heaven, and we eagerly await his coming again in glory. 
We thank you that by your grace alone you have accepted us in Christ, and here we offer you a spiritual sacrifice, holy and acceptable in your sight. Through Christ, receive this our duty and service, and grant that we who eat and drink these holy gifts may by your Holy Spirit be one body in Christ and serve you in unity and peace, in your grace and mercy. Bring us to the joy of your eternal kingdom with all the company of the redeemed. May we praise you in union with them and give you glory through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him and with him and in him. Amen. In the unity of the Holy Spirit. All glory and honour is yours, almighty Father, for ever and ever. And now in company with God's people and with one voice, let us pray to the Father in the words the Saviour gave to us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who are called to his supper. Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but only say the word, and I shall be healed. Brothers and sisters, I invite those of you who have the reserve sacrament with you at home to receive now, as we in the church do. And after that, we will have the prayer for those making a spiritual communion. The body of Christ. Amen.
Now I invite those of you who are making a spiritual communion to pray with me. At your feet, O Jesus, I prostrate myself before you with an unworthy yet contrite heart, yet longing to be in your Eucharistic presence. I love the gift of yourself offered to me in this great and blessed sacrament. Though unable to receive this food for my journey, I desire all the graces that this encounter with you can bring and offer my heart afresh as a place where you might dwell. While I wait for the day when I shall again have the joy of sacramental communion, I trust in your desire to abide in me and wish to possess you in spirit. Come to my heart, Lord Jesus. There is room in my heart for thee. Amen. And now the communion hymn, Be Still My Soul. Let us pray. We praise and thank you, O Christ, for this sacred feast. For here we receive you. Here the memory of your passion is renewed. Here our minds are filled with grace. And here a pledge of future glory is given when we shall feast at that table where you reign with all your saints forever. Amen. Uh, brothers and sisters, um, just before uh, the blessing, I want to thank everyone who's been involved uh, 
in, in uh, this service. Thank you to our musicians. Um, and thank you, Marjorie, very much for your contribution and for the way you give yourself heart and soul uh, to the music. It's, it's greatly appreciated. We love you here. We love you here. And also, of course, to Stephen, our organist, and to uh, uh, Javi and uh, Deacon Katie. Um, now, in the coming week on Wednesday, uh, I'll be out in the garden with, uh, under the rules I can do this with just five of us. Uh, for a baptism and confirmation in the garden. We have three candidates, uh, one for confirmation who's already been baptized and two uh, for baptism and confirmation. And the first one, Jesse, he will be baptized on uh, Wednesday um, in the garden. Um, we're only allowed to have five folk there, but uh, please, please uh, spare a prayer for him on Wednesday as he uh, turns towards the Son of, the Lord, Son of God and gives his life to Christ and receives the sacrament of confirmation and, of course, of Holy Communion. So that's Jesse, and we look forward, we've looked forward to that day. And then uh, uh, Lucas and Alan will have their time. Lucas lives further than 5Ks away, so we have to wait till those restrictions have uh, been uh, removed, and then I will confirm Alan as well. Now, uh, this week there are some Saints Days. I, I'd, uh, I know that some parishioners are very, very fond of St. Francis of Assisi, whose day it is today. Uh, you may not in the church replace a Sunday, which is always the Lord's Day, with a Saint's Day, but we give thanks for the life of St. Francis and um, pray a blessing on all those of you who have uh, pets. I know in many churches there'll be pet services normally, uh, giving thanks for uh, uh, really the devotion and friendship that come uh, through that part of God's created order. Well, Francis had a deep love of the whole of creation, uh, but he also had a deep love for the Blessed Sacrament and also for Mary, the mother of the Lord. And it's worth uh, uh, Googling St. Francis and some of his prayers and writings, um, very deep and, and uh, wonderful. And even now, uh, the Franciscans are perhaps one of the strongest religious orders in the church. And uh, Assisi, a place that draws people uh, in a wonderful, wonderful way. So that's St. Francis today. And then on Tuesday, there are two people who are remembered, St. Faith. Uh, she's not a very well-known saint, um, uh, but she's a favorite of mine because I was a parish priest in South London of St. Faith's Church, Red Post Hill. And St. Faith uh, was a martyr from the uh, fourth century, I think it was. And uh, her, her, her relics um, became a great draw uh, uh, for pilgrims, her head, is stored in a remarkable reliquary in a place called Conque in France, a very beautiful, beautiful church. Um, and um, so Google her, she's an interesting uh, character, young martyr. And then on that day too, the Anglican church particularly remembers William Tyndale. Now William Tyndale lived at the time of the Reformation and he is um, considered responsible for the first translation of the scriptures into English. He had a deep passion that the people of God should have access to Scripture. It's remarkable for us that for such a thing and for other things too, he was martyred, but um, those were strange days. But to him we owe so much uh, the Scripture in the hands of God's people. And then on Friday, St. Denis, St. Denis, who is the patron of Paris, I think, and he was a uh, um, martyred, uh, he was a bishop of the church in the third century and um, I think this is probably a legend but he, um, he had his head chopped off, I don't think that's legend but there is a legend that he proceeded to walk down the street carrying his head in his hand preaching uh, a sermon about repentance and well they might have repented if that's what they did to him. Um, I think it's probably of stretching it a bit far but he was a godly, godly bishop in the church. So that's on uh, Friday. Google them, Google them and ponder on their lives and your own call to holy living. Uh, next week, Mass will be on online and I think I'm right that the next uh, chapter in Deacon Katie's uh, work on um, um, uh, the book of Exodus will be up soon. Now the blessing. May God the Father who made you for himself watch over and protect you. May the Lord Jesus Christ be your friend and your brother on the way. And may the Holy Spirit encourage you and strengthen you 
as you seek to do the Father's will. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Now let's go in the peace of Christ. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Thank you.